Hi. So today we're going to be reading about love or in Pali Mitta. And this is from the text called The Four Sublime States Contemplations on Love, Compassion, Sympathetic Joy, and Equanimity by Jnana Punikatera. And so today we're going to be recollecting on the four sublime states. So we get a chance to remember what are those and um, for future um, times where we can remind ourselves of these four and even if we haven't heard about these before it's going to be an awesome thing to learn today learn about today these four sublime states and I'm going to skip the intro to the text and get right into love and I hope that I will be going from, from love to compassion and sympathetic joy and equanimity and then to how these states are interconnected or how the interrelations are between these four and I think we should get right into the text this is going to be another great text So I will do my best and try to pronounce the words correctly. As I also listen to this, um, this Dhamma. So I also get a chance to recollect and saturate my mind in it. So in the future I will be able to recall it and remember it. maybe even pass it on like I'm doing to you guys right now to anyone watching this and so let's do the intro Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa homage to the Perfectly enlightened Buddha. And here we go. Contemplations on the four sublime states. One. Love. Or Mitta. Love without desire to possess, knowing well that in the ultimate sense there is no possession and no possessor. This is the highest love. Love without speaking and thinking of an I, knowing well that this so-called I is a mere delusion. Love without selecting and excluding, knowing well that to do so means to create love's own contrasts, like disliking, aversion, and hatred. Love 
embracing all beings, small and great, far and near, be it on earth, in the water, or in the air. Love, embracing impartiality, all sentient beings, and not only those who are useful, pleasing or amusing to us. Love, embracing all beings, be they noble-minded or low-minded, good or evil, the noble and the good are embraced because love is flowing to them spontaneously. The low-minded and evil-minded are included because they are those who are the most in need of love. In many of, in many of them, the seed of goodness may have died merely because warmth was lacking for its growth because it perished from cold in a loveless world. Love embracing all beings, knowing well that we are fellow wayfarers through this round of existence, that we are all overcome by the same law of suffering. Love but not the sensuous fire that burns, scorches, and tortures, that inflicts more wounds than it cures, flaring up at the next morning, oh, flaring up now, at the next moment being extinguished, leaving behind more coldness and loneliness than was felt before. Rather love that lies like a soft but rather love that lies like a soft but firm hand in the ailing of beings, ever unchanged in its sympathy without wavering, unconcerned with any response it meets. Love that is comforting coolness to those who burn with the fire of suffering and passion that is life give that is life giving warmth to those abandoned in the cold desert, desert of loneliness to those who are shivering in the frost of a loveless world to those whose hearts have become as if empty and dry by the repeated calls for help by deepest despair. Love that is the sublime nobility of heart and intellect which knows, understands and is ready to help. Love that is strength and gives strength. This is the highest love. Love, which by the Enlightened One was named the liberation of the heart, the most sublime beauty. This is the highest love. And what is the highest manifestation of love? To show the world the path leading to the end of suffering, the path pointed out, trodden, and realized to perfection by him, the exalted one, the Buddha. And number two, compassion, karuna. The world suffers. But most men have their eyes and ears closed. They do not see the unbroken stream of tears 
flowing through life. They do not hear the cry of, of distress continually pervading the world. Their own little grief or joy bars their sight, deafens their ears. Bound by self selfishness, their hearts turn stiff and narrow. Being stiff and narrow, how should they be, be able to strive for any higher goal? To realize that only release from selfish craving will affect their own freedom from suffering. It is compassion that removes the heavy bar, opens the door to freedom, makes the narrow heart as wide as the world. Compassion takes away from the heart the inert weight, the paralyzing heaviness. It gives wings to those who cling to the lowlands of self. Let me see if I can fix the camera. Through compassion, the fact of suffering remains vividly present in our mind. Even at times, we personally are free from it. It gives us rich experience of suffering, thus strengthening us to meet it prepared when it does befall us. Compassion reconciles us to our own destiny by showing us the life of others often much harder than ours. Behold the endless caravan of beings, men and beasts, burdened with sorrow and pain. The burden of, of every one of them we also have carried in bygone times during the unfathomable sequence of repeated births. Behold this and open your heart to compassion. And this and this misery may well be our own destiny again. He who is without compassion now will one day cry for it. If sympathy with others is lacking, it will have to be acquired through one's own long and painful experience. This is the great law of life. Knowing this, keep guard over yourself. Being sunk in ignorance, lost in delusion, hasten from one state of suffering to another, not knowing the real cause, not knowing the escape from it. This insight into the general law of suffering is the real foundation of our compassion, not any isolated fact of suffering. Hence, our compassion will also include those who at the moment may be happy, but act with an evil and deluded mind. In their present deeds, we shall foresee their future state of distress and compassion will arise. The compassion of the wise man does not render him a victim of suffering. His thoughts, words and deeds are full of pity, but his heart does not waver. Unchanged it remains, serene and calm. How else should, be, how else should he be able to help? May such compassion arise in our hearts. Compassion that is sublime nobility of heart and intellect which knows, understands, and is ready to help. Compassion that is strength and gives strength, this is the highest compassion. And what is the highest manifestation of compassion? To show the world the path leading to the end of suffering, the path pointed out 
trodden and realized to perfection by him, the exalted one, the Buddha. Number three, sympathetic joy, mutita. Not only, not only to compassion, but also to joy with others. Open your heart. Small indeed is the share of happiness and joy allotted to beings. When, whenever a little happiness comes to them, then you may rejoice that at least one ray of joy has pierced through the darkness of their lives and dispel the grey and gloomy mist that, envo envo that enwraps their hearts. That's a funny word, enwraps. It's not funny that it is enwrapping their hearts. So we should rejoice in their happiness whenever we can. Continuing, your life will gain in joy by sharing the happiness of others as if it were yours. Did you never observe how, in moments of happiness, men's features change and become bright with joy? Did you never notice how joy rouses men to noble aspirations and deeds, exceeding their normal cap capacity? Did not such an experience fill your own heart with joyful bliss? It is in your power to increase such experience of sympathetic joy by producing happiness in others, by bringing them joy and solace. Let us teach real joy to men. Many have unlearned it. Life, through life, though full of vow, 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 life, though th though full of vow, holds also sources of happiness and joy, unknown to most. Let us teach people to seek and to find real joy within themselves, and to rejoice with the love of others. Let us teach them to unfold their joy to ever sublimer heights. Noble and sublime joy is not foreign to the teaching of the enlightened one. Wrongly, the Buddha's teaching is sometimes considered to be a doctrine diffusing melancholy. Far from it. The Dhamma leads step by step to an ever purer and loftier happiness. That's a good word, I think. Lo something lofty. That's like being a Buddhist. In our tradition, is like something very lofty. Continuing on. Noble and sublime joy is a helper on the path to the extinction of suffering. Not he who is dis depressed by grief, but one possessed of joy finds that serene calmness leading to a con contemplative state of mind. And only a mind serene and collected is able to gain the liberating wisdom, which is to experience Nibbana, I'm sure. The more sublime and noble the joy of others is, the more justified will our own symp will be our own sympathetic joy. A cause for joy with others is their noble life securing them happiness here and in lives hereafter. A still nobler cause for our joy, for our joy with others, is their faith in the Dhamma. There's a little fly. 
their understanding of the Dhamma, their following the Dhamma. Let us give them the help of the Dhamma. Let us strive to become more and more able ourselves to render such help. Wow, those flies are coming over here now. <laughs> okay, let the flies be. And I was just thinking that when you help, when you help yourself, you help other others, and when you help others, you help yourself. I always remember this dhamma. Continuing, sympathetic joy means a sublime nobility of heart and intellect which knows, understands, and is ready to help. Sympathetic joy that is strength and gives strength. This is the highest joy. And what is the and what is the highest manifestation of sympathetic joy? To show the world the path leading to the end of suffering, the path pointed out and trodden and realized to perfection by him, the exalted one, the Buddha. Sits over there, like that, just behind Sariputta, his chief disciple. And continuing on now with number four, Upeka or uh, equanimity. Equanimity is a perfect, unshakable balance of mind, rooted in insight, looking, looking at the world around us and looking into our own heart. We see clearly how difficult it is to at attain and maintain balance of mind. Looking into life, we notice how it continually moves between contrast, rise and fall, success and failure, loss and gain, honor and blame. We feel how our hearts respond to all this with happiness and sorrow, delight and despair, disappointment and satisfaction, hope and fear. These waves of emotion carry us up and fling us down, and no sooner do we find rest than we are in the power of a new wave again. How, how can we expect to get a, a footing on the crest of the waves? How can we erect the building of our lives in the midst of this ever restless ocean of existence, if not on the island of equanimity. A world where that little a world where that little share of happiness allotted to beings is mostly secured after many disappointments, failures and defeats. A world where only the courage to start anew again and again promotes success. A world where scanty joy grows amidst sickness, separation and death. A world where beings who were a shot were a short while ago connected with us by sympathetic joy are at the next moment in want of our compassion. Such world needs equanimity. But the kind of equanimity required has to be based on vigilant presence of mind, not on indifferent dullness. It has to be the result of heart... <laughs> There's a fly on the camera. It has to be the result of a heart deliberate training and not the casual outcome <laughs> of a passing mood. But equanimity would not deserve its name if it had not be had if it had to be produced by exertion again and again. In such a case it would surely be weakened and finally defeated by the vicissitudes of life. True equanimity, however, should be able to meet all these severe tests 
and to regenerate its strength from sources within. It will, it will possess this power of resistance and self-renewal only if it is rooted in insight. Major key. What now is the nature of that insight? It is clear it is the clear understanding of how all these vicissitudes of life originate and of our own true nature. We have to understand that the various experiences we undergo result from our karma, our actions in thought, word and deed performed in this life and in earlier lives. Karma is the womb from which we spring, karma yoni. And whether we like it or not, we are in inalienable owners of our own deeds, Kamma Saka. But as soon as we have performed any action, our control over it is lost. It forever remains with us and inevitably returns to us as our due heritage, Kamma Dayada. There's a fly on the camera. Nothing that happens to us come from an outer, hostile world, foreign to ourselves. Everything is the outcome of our own mind and deeds. Because this knowledge frees us from fear, it is the first basis of equanimity. When in everything that befalls us, we only meet ourselves. Why should we fear? If, however, fear of uncertainty should arise, fear or uncertainty should arise, we know the refuge where it can be allayed are good deeds. Kamma Patisarana. By taking this ref refuge, confidence and courage will grow within us. Confidence in the protecting power of our good deeds done in the past, courage to perform more good deeds. Right now, despite the discouraging hardships of our present life, like all these flies, I don't know where they come from. They're probably coming inside now because it's getting cold, so they are trying to get security. And we're gonna give them a little bit of security if they can behave. Okay. For we know that the no, mm, for we know the noble and selfless. De blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry. For we know that noble and selfless deeds <laughs> provide the best defense against the hard blows of destiny. That it is never too late, but always the right time for good actions. In that refuge, in doing good and in avoiding evil becomes firmly established within us, one day we shall feel assured. More and more ceases the misery and evil rooted in the past. And this present life, I try to make good, I try to make it spotless and pure. What else can the future bring that increase than increase of the good? And from that certainty, our mind will become serene and we shall gain the strength of patience and equanimity to bear with all our present advers adversities. Then our deeds will be our friends. Kamma Bantu Be friends with your actions. Likewise, all the various events of our lives, being the result of our deeds, will also be our friends, even if they bring us sorrow or pain. Our deeds should return to us in a guise that often makes them unrecognizable. Sometimes our actions return to us in the way that others treat us, 
sometimes as a thorough upheaval in our lives. Often the results are against our expectation or con contrary to our wills. Such experiences point out to us the consequences of our deeds we did not foresee. They render visible half-conscious motives of our former actions, which we tried to hide even from ourselves. Covering them up with various pretexts. If we learn to see things from this angle, and to read the message conveyed by our own experience, then suffering too will be our friend. It will be a stern friend, but a truthful and well-meaning one who teaches us the most difficult subject, knowledge about ourselves, and warns us against abyss, to, abyss towards which we are moving blindly by looking at suffering as our teacher and friend, we shall better succeed in enduring it with equanimity. Consequently, the teaching of karma will give us a powerful impulse for freeing ourselves from karma, from those deeds that again and again throw us into the suffering of repeated births, disgust will arise at our own craving. Uh at our own delusion, at our own propensity to create situations which we try our strength, our resistance and our equanimity. The second insight, I hope, okay, one minute left, I'm gonna get as far as I can and then put the text. The second insight on which equanimity should be based is the Buddhist teaching of non, no self, Anatta. This doctrine shows that in the ultimate sense, deeds are not performed by any self, nor do their results affect any self. Further, it shows that there is no self. We cannot speak of my own. It is the delusion of a self that creates suffering and hinders our, or disturbs equanimity. If this or that quality of ours is blamed, one thinks I am blamed, and equanimity is shaken. If this or that does not succeed, one thinks my work has failed, and equanimity is shaken. If wealth or loved ones are lost, one thinks what is mine has gone, and equanimity is shaken. And I'm going to post the last three passages here below the video because we only have 20 seconds left. And no, I'm going to be making a part two to this video and it's going to be a short one. So this will be a series, a two part series. So stopping the video.